Travel in the early modern period was difficult and dangerous, and journeys often took years, not least because travelers had to carry along many provisions, making movement cumbersome. So planning in advance was crucial to the successful journey, whether one was a political or commercial envoy, missionary, soldier, gentleman traveler, or adventurer. It was to the curious traveler's advantage if he could obtain information about the languages spoken in the regions where he traveled. Since the late 16th century, dictionaries, grammars, and reading material of various languages spoken in Asia were published in Rome, Antwerp, Leiden, Paris, and other European cities. Most early modern European travelers to Safavid Iran were accompanied by guides and did not need to know in detail the routes to take and what to do when they got lost. Yet many of them learned how to work with an astrolabe, a quadrant, or a sundial. Such knowledge was helpful for determining time while traveling between two cities or even inside a city, since public sundials, clepsidras, uh, water clocks, or other forms of clocks were rare. The aspiring traveler would acquire letters of credit and letters of safeguard at home and in the countries he passed through. Letters of introduction and gifts were indispensable, as was knowledge about whom to contact and where to find compatriots, such as ambassadors, consuls, and missionaries. The next category, travel. There were two main ways to travel to Safavid Iran in the early modern period, by ship and over land. A sea voyage could either take the traveler around the Cape of Good Hope, and travelers from England, Spain, and Portugal often chose this first route, along with the dangers that could ensue, such as storms, so here in a, a Dutch account. And here is another storm. This is um, from Adam Oliarius's travel account, and I'll be talking about him uh, quite a bit this evening. And here you can see, um, so the ship is going down, and they're bringing horses onto land, and the first people on land are starting to dry their, their clothes on, on land. And so they, this is near, um, this is an island off the coast of Estonia. And they made it onto the mainland and then they had to wait for several weeks because all the presents went down, uh, down into the sea. And so you, you couldn't go on a diplomatic mission without presents. So um, they had to wait uh, until, until new presents were, were um, obtained from Germany. Um, there are other dangers such as the horrible shark fish as Thomas Herbert <laughs> indicates. And then um, in the Persian Gulf, you had to watch out for uh, water spouts. So these are like uh, tornadoes on the sea. And, and Jean de Tevenon, he, he gives a very detailed um, depiction of how these things form at different stages. Here you see a ship in the background. And here we have uh, Tavernier's map of the Persian Gulf, and it has um, bathymetric data here, so it includes the depths of the water in the Persian Gulf. So here you see the, the Persian Gulf, and then there are many different perspectives. It's, it's kind of crude, but, but it's a, a kind of cute map. Um, here you have a, a banyan tree, which was enormous um, near Bandar Abbas on the Persian Gulf, and several of the travelers, they, they um, write about this banyan tree and, and uh, have depictions of it. Uh, travelers from Italy, France, or the Netherlands preferred to sail across the Mediterranean Sea and then continue overland, for example, from Aleppo to Baghdad, or from Istanbul to Tiflis or to Erevan. Uh, a third route from Europe to Iran led through Russia to the Caspian Sea where the travelers embarked on a ship sailing to the southwestern shores and then continued overland. And several British and German travelers took this route, including two German authors, whom I'll be mentioning several times, Adam Oliarius. So this is actually the, the route of uh, Adam Oliarius, uh, going from Hamburg. So here's the, where they had the first um, shipwreck. And then they continued down the Volga and then they had their second shipwreck off the coast of Azerbaijan, modern day Azerbaijan. And then they continued overland. So they, they waited uh, three months in Shemakha, this is modern day Azerbaijan. Um, this is the border of the Safavid Empire. 
and then they waited for permission from Isfahan to continue on their journey. So then they continued down to, to Isfahan. Uh, the other German traveler I'll mention several times is the uh, German doctor Engelbert Kempfer. And he traveled along the same route. He was uh, with a Swedish embassy and they went on the same route uh, 50 years later, so in 1685. And Kempfer took along Oliaris' book on his journeys and he was very picky. He said wherever, wherever Oliaris made a mistake, he said, oh, I found another mistake that Oliaris made. And so he, he is constantly in a dialogue with, with uh, his predecessor. So, the means of travel included different types of sailing ships, small river boats, and rafts. And here we have a depiction of raft. So, you see the camels being transported across the river in the Dutch account. Um, merchants, okay, so there were rafts, horses, camels, and walking. Merchants also would travel on donkeys or mules or camels, and they also walked. And here's another form of conveyance. So, this is uh, women would travel in these they're called Ketsawehan. So this is like a litter uh, on, a, on a camel, basically. And so the women would not be seen as they travel. The time of traveling depended on the natural conditions of the territory that needed to be traversed. In deserts and semi-deserts, travel mostly took place during the night or in the early hours of the day. In mountainous areas, one traveled often until the early afternoon hours. The length of daily travel could vary, but was on average about six to seven hours. Many travelers did not travel alone, but in groups. Overland travel often followed the main caravan routes, and travelers joined caravans since they represented the cheapest and safest method of transportation. As a rule, commercial and diplomatic travelers to Safavid Iran traveled within the country under the protection of the Shah. This meant that once they arrived at the first major Iranian city, they went to see the local governor or ruler and asked for provisions, guides, guards, horses, and passports to ensure a safe journey. Merchants and other travelers had to carry most of their provisions, including sleeping mats, cutlery, and food. After a daily journey ended, the travelers lodged with families, slept in open terrain, or stayed in caravanserais. And here's a depiction, not very realistic, of a caravanserai by Thomas Herbert, and here we have a more realistic version uh, by Jean Chardin, and this is in the city of Kashan. We'll come back to Kashan later, but this shows a, a typical um, caravanserai where the the animals would usually be um, put into these lower areas in the in the nighttime, and then the travelers would stay on the top floor, and usually there would be. A, water source in the center of the courtyard, so um, usually a well, something like this. And the important thing was it could be locked up at night, so you wouldn't have to worry about robbers. Um, in addition to provisions and passports, European travelers to Safa de Iran needed to bring financial means and gifts. Arms were standard components of a traveler's luggage. In contrast to the oftentimes dangerous routes in the Ottoman Empire, the safety of the major overland routes in Safa de Iran was often lauded by European travelers. Issues of health care were also very important, and commercial and diplomatic missions often included a physician or a surgeon. Many travelers hired a painter from Europe, either at home or en route, for recording their travel experience visually. But not many painters seem to have accompanied their employers to their final destination. Several travelers recount conflicts with, or the loss of, the hired painter due to various reasons, including the traveler's stinginess. And this is actually the case for Jean Chardin, that we see there. Some travelers also hired a man of the cloth as a travel companion for their religious needs. Another important member of many travel groups was the interpreter, usually hired upon arriving in one of the first cities in Iran. Next, history. Safavid Iran served as an endpoint of travel as well as a line of transit. It was not entirely unknown to the, uh, to the educated visitor because he had studied Iranian history, geography, conflicts and victories in classical literature that had been revived in the Renaissance. He also knew of its ancient peoples and societies, its rulers and their contacts with the world through his study of the Bible and other religious texts. The Westerners saw 
customs, landscapes, and policies that seem to be identical to those described by Herodotus, Xenophon, Pliny the Elder, Curtius Rufus, Polybius, and other ancient writers, and that they believed had not changed over the centuries. The visitors structured and described territories under the Safavid dynasty according to concepts they found in Strabo's or Ptolemy's geographies, and were eager to determine which geographical unit of Safavid Iran corresponded to names they had found in ancient sources. And here, I'll just show a few maps that um, underline this point. So here we have the, the Tabula Asiae Septem, so the seventh table of Asia of Ptolemy's geography, in the edition by Sebastian Münster from 1540. And you see um, so where the Scythians were to be found, and the Medes, and the Sarmatians, and then I'll point here to the depiction of the Caspian Sea, which is longer from east to west than from north to south, as it should be. And this shape stays with us for quite a while. Um, next, here is the Teatrum Orbis Terrarum, the frontispiece of um, um, Ortelius's wonderful atlas, and you can see it over there in a wonderful contemporary color. And Ortelius um, has a very nice map of, of uh, the Persian Empire. So here is his map of the Caspian. You see it's the same shape. And then here already there are uh, lots of toponyms, so lots of uh, cities that have been added to the interior. And these were taken from uh, an Italian uh, cartographer named uh, Gastaldi. This is 1584. And then by the mid 17th century, we have Olearius's map of the Persian Empire. And you see already the Caspian Sea is on its way to acquiring the correct shape. So um, the Caspian should actually be like this. And so Olearius, uh, when, he, when he returned to Europe and he published his, his account, he, he was given a lot of grief by um, his friends, uh, especially Dutch cartographers, who said, what, what is this shape? It's completely wrong. And Oliari said, well, he has been to this area and he talked also to locals. He wasn't able to, to go around the, to travel around the whole um, the lake as he wanted to, but he said, this is already the, the way that it, it should be. It's already much better. Um, and he was right. Okay, so, um, Early modern travelers were eager to acquire ancient coins and medals and to copy ancient inscriptions. Various numismatic collections in European museums have their origins in these activities. The travelers were primarily interested in ancient Greek and Latin artifacts, uh, as well as antiquities from ancient Egypt. Once in Iran, knowledge of ancient historians like Herodotus inspired them to pay attention to the Achaemenid kings who had challenged the Greek city-states and who had been defeated by Alexander the Great. Those travelers who arrived or left by a ship from a port in the Persian Gulf often passed through Shiraz, from where they went to visit and contemplate the ruins of Persepolis. There they encountered monumental pillars, friezes, like this one by Cornelius de Brown, Dutch traveler, uh, animal torsos, and human figures. But it was the cuneiform inscriptions that attracted the attention of the visitors and puzzled them. And so here, here we have an inscription by Engelbert Kempfer. For those of you who know German, um, Kempfer was uh, the one who coined the phrase Keilschrift, which is uh, cuneiform. Term. So it was the cuneiform inscriptions that attracted the attention of the visitors and puzzled them. They and their painters spent hours sitting on the plateaus and stairs of the various, build uh, of the various buildings, carefully copying the signs that they could not decipher. Later travelers also copied the rich figurative decorations on the walls of the buildings and tombs hewn into the rocks. And here we see Kempfer, who is uh, depicting the scene. And if you look very closely, you can see nice little details. Here we have a stork that has built its uh, nest on top of one of the pillars of, of uh, Persepolis. And Kempfer here is also depicting himself um, he's, he's sketching the whole scene, and this also is a guarantee of the proof that he was there and that 
what we see in front of our eyes can be believed. And so this is um, a constant preoccupation of the traveler because there's a told us since the time of Herodotus that travelers are all liars. And so the European travelers have to do something to um, they have to assure the reader that what what you are reading, what you are seeing is actually uh, believable and so they, they spend a lot of time, especially in the prefaces, saying, I was there, I saw this, these depictions are based on eyewitness testimony, and you can ask the other members of the, of the um, embassy that this is all true. So, um, with more time, I could get into this topic, but I, I don't have that much time. All right, um, let's see, we continue with comments. With regard to trade in Iran, English and Dutch merchants were more successful than their other European counterparts since they managed to establish factories in Bandar Abbas, Isfahan, and a few other places. They traded textiles, precious and other metals, sugar, indigo, drugs, and a number of special goods such as exotic woods. India, as the itineraries of many early modern travelers to Iran show, was another important trading partner of Safavid Iran. Iran functioned as an overland or maritime transit zone from India to the Ottoman Empire. And Europe received transit goods from Iran coming from India and other parts of Asia that were transported by Armenian, Dutch, English, Russian, and Swedish merchants. Indian merchants and moneylenders resided in cities and ports along the Persian Gulf and participated in the horse trade, the delivery of steel, copper, coins, and precious stones, such as this ruby as well as the transport of spices and textiles. In addition to bullion and raw silk, Iran exported mainly horses and goat's hair, and a number of other items in lesser quantity, such as dried fruits and nuts, rhubarb, rose water, and wine. European visitors to Safavid Iran paid for their transactions with a variety of Safavid silver and copper coins, as well as various European coins, in particular Venetian gold, and Spanish and Dutch silver coins. Several travelers, among them Olyarius and Tavernier, described the monetary units that circulated within Iran. Here we have uh, money of the king of Persia in Tavernier's six voyages in the English edition. Next, the life sciences. For the early modern traveler, all the world was truly a stage, a teatro mundi that revealed the presence of a great chain of being linking the earthly microcosm with the greater divine macrocosm. Nature, in its various manifestations, animal, vegetable, and mineral, was studied, classified, and if possible, brought back to Europe for display in cabinets of curiosity. And here, Olyarius um, has the depiction of the, the Gottorfische Kunstkammer. So this is Gottorf, um, which is the, the town where um, Olyarius was working for the Duke. And the Kunstkammer has all kinds of strange objects from all over the world. Here you see some stuffed fish in the background, and then statues, and a Russian icon, and, and costumes. So everything that was of interest would be, would be displayed in these cabinets. Including objects such as spiders. So here we have tarantulas. So the, the city of Kashan um, is famous or infamous because it has um, lots of tarantulas as well as scorpions and you can't see them as well but you have scorpions hiding alongside the cartouche and on the ground here in the, in the depiction of Kashan. Here we have something called, uh, uh, it's an ice house actually, so they would, they would store ice during the, during the summer and um, have sherbet with it. And then uh, well, the fact that, that there's so many strange and dangerous um, vermin here um, was appealing to, to other later compilers. So here we have uh, John Ogilvy's his work on Asia. You have what looks like a tarantula fighting against a scorpion, and then there's a, an eagle swooping down. And the perspective is all off. Whenever I see this, I think immediately of, of Mothra versus Godzilla or something like that because it's, the perspective is all wrong. But anyway, um, Olyanis notes that he alone out of the entire entourage 
was stung by one of the scorpions um, of Kashan in the neck when he was in the city of Kashanafi. And he describes the painful symptoms that he experienced. And then he decides to take back, he was able to capture the scorpion and he took it and put it in oil and then he displayed it in the, in the Kunstkammer in, in Germany when he returned. Um, on the other hand, if one is bitten by a tarantula, Oliarius advises that the victim should try to kill the animal that inflicted the bite and place it against the wound, and that according to the law of sympathies, the poison in the human would be attracted back to the scorpion and the cure would follow. So this is what we have in the 17th century. Um, botany was in a state of transition during this period. Naturalists and scholars were interested not only in rediscovering plants that classical and medieval authors had described, but also in discovering new, previously unknown plants. And uh, Dr. Engelbert Kempfer was very interested in plants. He has some lovely um, drawings. These are in the uh, Sloan collection in the British Library. And here is another one. And uh, now we come to the title, uh, namely uh, Kempfer's observations on the Scythian lamb, or the Boromitz fruit, also known as the vegetable lamb of Tartary, uh, concerns a myth about a zoophyte. So that is a plant animal, or a plant that was supposed to possess animal qualities. According to the legend, which had been known in Europe since the Middle Ages, there exists a plant known as the Boromitz, or Baranetz, that grows in the shape of a lamb in Tartary, or near the Caspian Sea. The plant is covered with a very fine skin, which the inhabitants remove and use for head coverings. It feeds on grass and is devoured by wolves. So after conducting inquiries in the area, Kempfer comes to the conclusion that no such plant exists. He speculates that the word boromets is related to the Slavic word for sheep, baran, or bare in Persian. And he goes on to describe characteristics of the karakul sheep, a breed found around the Caspian and as far away as the Persian Gulf, around the Basra. The skins of little lambs and even fetuses of this breed are prized for their delicate wool, which is used on the borders of robes and cloaks and made for the upper classes. And Kempfer concludes that this is how the fable was passed on, namely that these skins were taken to far off lands and that the true explanation of their origins was misunderstood or lost over time. In short, the fable actually has to do with the cotton pod and the similarity of cotton and wool, and the misunderstanding of such figurative phrases as fleece that grows on trees. So, a Persian plant that Kempfer discusses in detail in his work, the Ammonitates Exotique, is the Asafetida plant, which is praised for its sap, from which a malodorous drug is produced. This medication is used for colics of the stomach and lower intestines by pharmacists both in the Middle East and in, and in Europe. Kempfer notes that its most striking characteristic, quote, is its taste is goat-like with bitterness and has an aromatic sharpness. Because of its horrid stench, the Germans call it Teufelsdreck, that is, devil's dung, quote. He notes that the stench is an index of excellence and the stronger the stench, the better the hasa. Kempfer includes an engraving of the plant and of the various stages of, of the harvest and enjoins the reader, quote, for clarity, the reader should consult the illustration. Kempfer also provides an important account of the date palm, which he terms Phoenix Persicus. Here, too, he describes the plant, examines the origin of the plant's name, then lists the conditions for its growth and the various stages of the date harvest including the celebrations held after the harvest. <clears throat> As a medical doctor, Kempfer was very interested in describing the properties of drugs, medical potions, and intoxicants uh, that are used in Iran, such as cannabis, opium, and tobacco. His observations on Persian fauna were not nearly as extensive as his description of the country's flora. However, he did give a very basic overview of the animals he encountered especially those that were not well known in Europe. Um, in his work, he provides an account of the torpedo of the Persian Gulf, a type of electric ray. He also discusses the supposed medicinal properties of 
bezoar stones, which are extracted from bezoar goats. His account of the animals found in the region north of Bandar Abbas included uh, porcupines, leopards, deer, bears, and hyenas. And he also notes in Araya's side that jackals were especially numerous near the shores of the Caspian Sea, and that they, quote, stole leggings, shoes, and other leather goods from the tents that we had set up. Whatever was, not, whatever was too heavy for them to carry off, we found not too far away from our sleeping places. The mathematical sciences. The traveler's pursuit of mathematical knowledge in Safavid Iran included the acquisition of manuscripts and instruments, the study of methods of calculation, the measurement of solar altitudes, the determination of terrestrial latitudes, and the observation and description of eclipses and comets. Missionaries who resided in Isfahan and some other Safavid cities were important in the transmission of such knowledge. The superior of the Capuchins, Raphael Dumont, for instance, was, was responsible for a substantial part of Jean Chardin's report about mathematical literature in Safavid, Iran, and its authors. And here we have an example of a so-called magic square. And um, I don't know how it works, but anyway, if you multiply this times this, you get the product, which is this. So, the math geniuses in the audience, you can figure it out. <laughs> um, so this is called the, the net, this multiplication scheme. Um, let's see. So Chardin derived his information from talks with Dumas, and probably also from reading the friar's own writings about the country, about its nature, culture, and politics. Precious metals, military technology, astronomical instruments, and clocks were welcomed as merchandise and as gifts. They added to local knowledge and craftsmanship whereas precious items were preserved in the treasury. The, techni the technically more advanced objects, such as instruments or mechanical clocks, were often put aside in remote storage rooms. Reactions to new mechanical gadgets wavered between delight in their rich decoration and frustration caused by their unknown mechanisms. Christian craftsmen and adventurers were welcome to Iran. They took care of items in need of repair, or design plans and technologies for improving mining, minting, and other economic activities. Some European travelers, in turn, were interested in the technology they observed during their travels, such as the Kanat system of irrigation, and also the method for cooling houses in Iran. And here we have a depiction of a, it's called a badgir, and so this is a method for cooling a house. So here there are uh, slats in the window, which would um, could be moved, and um, they would get wind, any kind, any type of wind that was around, and directed down to the bottom of the house. And here there would be a, a pool of water, and so the wind would travel over this water and then circulate and cool the house. So it's a form of air conditioning, basically. Next, circulation of images. In the late 15th century, painters and woodcut artists began to accompany patrons who went to Muslim territories and wished to record their travels by means of images. First to the Ottoman Empire in North Africa, then to the Safavid Empire, the Mughal Empire, other Muslim states in India and Central Asia. Artists depicted antiquities, buildings, landscapes, rulers, courtiers, soldiers, merchants, members of different religious communities, artisans, animals, and city views. Here, for example, we have de Brown's wonderful panoramic view of Isfahan, which some of you probably already saw. And here we have a detail from the panorama. Um, here we have Engelbert Kempfer's uh, bird's eye view of Isfahan. And you see here the Maidan, I um, imagine some of you have been to Isfahan, to the Maidan. Um, if you haven't, maybe you've been to the um, Piazza San Marco in Venice, and imagine that this Maidan is about twice the size of the Piazza San Marco, so you get a sense of how large it is. Uh, they used to play polo in the grounds there. Here we have 
um, a view of the Maidan. And um, I'll give some description. So, Oliarius uh, talks about the Maidan in the following way. The Maidan, or main square, which is 700 paces long and 250 paces wide, um, is a wonderful feat. He says, uh, at the southern end, uh, you see the presence of a great and precious mosque that Shah Abbas I had ordered to be built. At the western end of the square, one can find the jewelers and goldsmiths, the Shah's palace and the Diwan Khane, the house of judgment, where the fortune where the fortune tellers ply their trade. You also see the treasure house there, and the harem, and the Ali Kapu, or the house of As asylum. The eastern side of the Maidan contains the shops of craftsmen. At the northern end of the square is the bazaar, where one, finds, one can find anything one's heart's desires. So there's rhubarb from China, and he gives the price. He also says that the, the different nationalities that are engaged in trade include Persians, Indians who sell the best silk, different types of Tatars, Turks, Jews, Armenians, Georgians, as well as Englishmen, Dutch, French, Italians, and Spaniards. Near the bazaar, we can find the different taverns, the Shire Khane, where one can uh, drink wine and find youths who dance lasciviously for the patrons. You, know, you also find the tea houses where people play chess, and the Kawe Khane, where people drink coffee, smoke tobacco, and listen to poets and storytellers. Engelbert Kempfer notes that all around the square one finds vaulted rooms, two stories high. The top level is divided into rooms for sleeping that are rented to foreigners or to prostitutes, whereas the rooms on the ground floor are mainly used by artisans who produce and sell their wares there. In front of the entrance to the bazaar in the square, one can find shopkeepers, sellers of used goods or sweets, hucksters, copper and tinsmiths, as well as comedians, wrestlers, poets, performers, and all manner of vagrants. And here, I'm sorry, I don't have a detail, but you can find um, two wrestlers here, and there's a goat here uh, that's balancing on top of, I think, some uh, wooden pieces of wood here, and then two goats who are fighting against each other, so yeah, what kind of... Um, entertainment is going on here. So this material, this type of material about the cities, was transformed into prints, provided elements for oil paintings, and was included in travel accounts. <coughs> Medals, coins, and political pamphlets also profited from visual impressions of rulers and people from Islamic states. European compilers of travel accounts and collectors of geographical information interviewed merchants from Iran about their trading routes and goods. Images of typical Persian men and women in foreign dress were also included in the accounts. So here, for example, you see uh, women, so Persian women, and you can see different types of dress according to their social standing. And here you have uh, men and their different costumes. And here you have a kizildash, a, a soldier. You also find depictions of uh, typical Persians in, uh, in costume books. So here we have a Persian satrap, so a, a nobleman, in the Trachtenbuch by Hans Weigel, 1577, which is quite uh, well depicted, um, in contrast to this depiction of a Tatar. And I always think of aesthetics and old books, for example, when I see uh, what this Tatar is supposed to look like. Um, the, these, these types of images of, of typical Persian uh, would be found on, um, on maps. So here we have uh, John Speed's um, map. So they became part of the frames of these um, Dutch, uh, Dutch, and um, Dutch and English maps from the 16th century on. And so typically you would find a Persian man and then a Persian woman as a complement figure. And then here we have uh, the depiction of Tartary, and here is the Tatar, and here I've made some, I've shown them in detail, so um, they're quite similar to the depiction of, of Baikal, we just saw. So histories of ancient and contemporary rulers of Iran were included in books about universal history. Scholarly texts in Arabic and Persian were copied by Christian immigrants from the Ottoman Empire, as well as converts from Iran, 
and annotated by scholars and amateurs in European centers of Oriental studies. Converts from Iran would come to Europe with the one or the other embassy, help to compile dictionaries and translate Persian poetry. Persian manners and customs became the stuff of a romantic and other literary fantasies. In Iran itself, themes and techniques of Renaissance prints and paintings had an impact on miniature paintings. So here for example, um, this begins with the last decades of the 16th century, and their transmission may have come via India. Throughout the entire 17th century, but particularly so in the second half, European landscapes, naturalistic flowers, trees, birds, and butterflies, Christian figures, European fashion, and nudes were highly appreciated components of Safavid art and were displayed in palaces, manuscripts, and albums. So, what about the publication of the travel accounts? Early modern travelers, writers, artists, and craftsmen cooperated in creating representations of the, of the society, territory, landscape, nature, and history of Safavid Iran. Famous engravers who had not seen the Safavid empire themselves provided illustrations based on sketches that a traveler or an artist had produced en route. Maps and images from other published sources were added by artists and publishers who modified them in various ways. In various ways. They copied Safavid artworks, Ottoman custom books, Italian, Dutch, and French maps, Portuguese and European depictions of Safavid cities, and ancient Greek and Latin geographies and histories. They lifted information, stories, images, and metaphors from each other and from ancient medieval and contemporary books and maps. Preparing a travel account for publication was therefore much more than collecting one's notes. There had to be quotes, explicit or not, from fellow travelers of the past and present, from ancient and modern writers that were appreciated for their style and knowledge, from the Bible and other sacred texts. In the course of the 17th century, Arabic, Persian, and Turkish authors and their texts became part of the canon to be consulted by a travel writer. However, not all authors wished to undertake this overwhelming amount of work themselves. They hired scholars, poets, or other talented people to collaborate with them. Sometimes these ghostwriters were identified in the finished product, more often they remained invisible. Final products were thus the result of complex activities and consisted of many layers which explained their thematic richness, their similarities with each other, their differences from Persian sources, their internal contradictions, and the verbal and pictorial fantasies contained in the accounts. The cooperative procedure of compiling travel accounts increased the spatial and temporal distance of the final text from the immediate travel experience. A further layer of transformation crept into the accounts when they were translated into foreign languages. Translators sometimes misunderstood the text. They freely edited passages and chapters, driven by the belief that a foreign language audience demanded it. Publishers also had an active role in the design of the often costly books, which of course they wanted to sell. They included frontispieces, images, and maps that had sold well already, or were composed of themes and icons well known to the public. Travel accounts that had little or no illustration in their first edition were often reprinted with sumptuous frontispieces, engravings, and maps in the next. Famous artists who themselves were also engravers or who collaborated with engravers were hired to design woodcuts or copper plate illustrations that depicted the ruler, his high officials, officers, and members of the court. Some of these depictions were based on observations by painters attached to the travel group, some based on miniatures made in Iran, some the product of a visual artist's vivid imagination. A well-prepared and well-to-do traveler would take, a uh, would take a painter along with him, but sometimes the traveler's level of skill and preparation were not up to the task. The process of transfer, by which paintings and sketches were transferred onto the copper plate, included decisions about type, size, and content of the final illustration, and it was often the publisher, not the traveler or his painter, who made the final decisions. Thus, the representation of Safavid Iran could suffer from choices made by the people who had never seen the country. In this context, one can refer to the work of Sonia Bletes, who writes about how verbal, cartographic, and pictorial, de uh, pictorial depictions of the Safavid Empire are often complex constructions 
that are not objective representations. And I should note that um, Sonia Valencias and I, we collaborated on, on the exhibits um, and uh, published a, a catalog. It was called From Rhubarb to Rubies. And uh, I have to write some of the information for today's talk from, from this catalog. In short, the visual representations of the Safavid Empire in European travel accounts must be examined individually and carefully in order to determine to what degree they are constructed from an artist's imagination and or from previous images and how much they represent the reality of what they are supposed to depict. Despite the fact that these European images are not realistic representations in the sense of a photographic likeness, in the absence of Safavid visual depictions of Safavid customs, cities and religious rituals, these European images are valuable depictions since they record how early modern European readers perceived and learned about the Safavids and their empire.